So after Gothic 1 was all over and done with, we wouldn't have to wait too long for another Gothic game. Gothic 2 released in October of 28, 2003, making it a little less than two years when you compare it to the release date of the first Gothic game. While Gothic 2 is pretty much the same game with a few differences, I find that to be pretty impressive, and good thing too because Gothic 2 is the best Gothic game, not to mention Piranha Bytes best game in general. Before I start however, Piranha Bytes fans would probably know by now that the studio might get shut down by Embracer Group. Apparently, and I got all this from a Game Informer article, the studio is in a difficult situation, with the CEO mentioning that hey, yeah we're in a difficult spot right now, but don't write us off yet, we'll do everything we can to continue creating worlds in which you can lose yourself in. I admittedly haven't done too much research on this topic, but apparently Embrace Group has been purging studios that began last year, and I hope the company stays afloat because, despite the fact that they kind of fell off after Gothic 3, I find Risen 1 and Elix 1 to still be pretty good games, with Elix 1 being the most recent other than the sequel which I haven't played. And of course, as soon as I start playing Gothic 2, one of my favorite games of all time, top 10 easily, that's when the company is going to start going under, possibly. Talk about bad luck. Now, what can I say about Gothic 2 that hasn't already been said? The game is a cult classic amongst Piranha Bytes fans, or just fans of computer role-playing games in general. I suppose I'll start off by saying that I won't be talking about Night of the Raven in this video. Night of the Raven was the add-on to the base Gothic game, which adds some extra areas, makes the game quite a bit harder, reintroduces some returning characters, and also basically rebalances the whole stats and skills gains. For example, instead of only costing one skill point to raise strength all the way to 100, it'll increase in increments the higher your strength or dex gets the further you get along into the game. Not to mention changing the stat requirements for weapons and such. And by extra areas, I mean that Knight of the Raven introduces a really big map for the main character to explore. And it's actually pretty chunky and sizable. And I'm going by purely memory here because I haven't played Knight of the Raven in a long time. And I honestly don't plan to because it's not my favorite add-on. It's an unpopular opinion, but I vastly prefer the base game over Knight of the Raven. And it's not because of the difficulty. The difficulty of Knight of the Raven is actually kind of welcome. Because admittedly the first two gothic games are pretty easy, especially for veteran CRPG gamers. I just find, oh, I don't know, that Knight of the Raven is kind of sloppily added on. For example, when you talk to Zardas in the very beginning of the game and he talks about what the Nameless should do in regards to the main story, they had to record new dialogue for the add-on. And his tone of voice is so drastically different from what he talks about in the base game that it kind of pulls me out of it. It just sounds very weird if that makes any sense. I just find the base Gothic 2 game to be a much more tighter and streamlined experience, if that also makes any sense. I felt that the add-on wasn't connected too well to the main story. But anyways, in order to play the base game in the first place, you have to install the Gothic 2 Classic mod. And honestly, despite having this game already on GOG as well as physical copies, I ended up buying the series again on Steam during the Christmas sale. Gothic 2 on Steam by default allows you to play Gothic 2 without the add-on. Though if you do, I recommend actually installing the Gothic 2 Classic mod anyways on the Steam Workshop because it does get updates every once in a while. Just be aware that it's not the pure Gothic 2 version we all know and love from back in the day because it does change a few things such as animations, different clothing models for some NPCs, as well as different armor models for some of the orc characters. They're admittedly minor and honestly welcome changes in my opinion. It still felt like the base game I played back in the day, so unless you want to be an absolute purist, just get the mod. You can install on GOG somehow, it's just easier on Steam in my opinion. Alright, let's finally, without further ado, talk about Gothic 2. So Gothic 2 is pretty much exactly the same as the first Gothic game, with a few changes such as you can learn how to forge weapons, craft runic magic, and learn alchemy. All the various skills you can learn are back, such as pickpockets, sneaking, skinning animals, picking locks, and the usual one-handed, two-handed, 
and bows and crossbows. Just like Gothic 1, Gothic 2 is the same immersive experience with great visuals, ambience, and atmosphere. Seriously, the backtracking in this game, and there is backtracking in this game, is honestly not that bad due to how scenic each and every area is. When I say that Gothic 2 is the best Piranha Bytes has to offer, it's because it did an excellent job crafting this believable world in which you yourself are just merely a part of. Just walking through the first town of the game, Carinus, you see that NPCs have their own schedules to keep, such as the blacksmith working at the forge, the carpenter hammering away on a piece of furniture in order to sell to make ends meet, illegal alley fights in the back areas of the harbor district, signifying the crime-ridden nature of that area, which is starkly contrasted with the upper quarter where all the rich nobles live, with their round-the-clock protection from the militiamen and the paladins. With me being a fan of Ultima 7, it's probably no surprise that I consider Gothic 1 and Gothic 2 to be some of my favorite games because these are the best examples of an Ultima successor. In fact, in Gothic 1, I consider that game to be like a Ultima 9 done correctly. I wouldn't be surprised back then that the devs were huge fans of the Ultima series. Whether they admitted that or not, I am not aware of it. But again, I wouldn't be surprised. Unlike Gothic 1, however, you don't just get one big map to explore. Now, the nameless hero gets to explore the island of Carinus, completely free of the magical bearer trapping him and the others within the prison colony. Aside from the large town of Carinus to explore, you get a large wilderness area with many caves and farmsteads with many NPCs to talk to, as well as do quests for. And the quest design in this game is pretty good. This is an old school game, so you're not going to get a quest marker leading to your next objective. Once you talk to an NPC, you basically have nothing to go by other than what they told you, as well as markings in your character's journal. Exploration pays off here, and exploration in Gothic 2 is one of the most rewarding things about it. For your first playthrough, you never know if you're going to find that right area for that quest giver, or a dangerous enemy that kills you in one hit. And that's one of the things I like about Gothic games, that even though you're level 0, you are completely free to explore all the map of Carinus if you really, really want to. You will most likely die if you venture off the beaten path and find yourself surrounded by black goblins near an ancient temple, but that's the magic of Gothic games. It doesn't bar you in any way with invisible barriers, nor locks your progression through a series of quests, like in, you know, typical video games. You're completely free, too, to swim off the island of Carinus if you just don't happen to like the place. A big scary sea monster will drag you into its depths, but I do like the freedom the developers gave you there. The character progression is also just as good as the first game. Just like in Gothic 1, it's so satisfying seeing your character start from a level 0 into basically a killing machine towards the mid to late game. But until then, the Nameless is basically wearing rags and has to work all over again to get his first decent sword and some decent leather armor. So just like Gothic 1, you have to join one of three factions in the game in order to get the best weapons and the best armor. And I'll mention which factions you can join in this game compared to Gothic 1 when I get to the story segment. Because I have to mention the combat first, and if you play Gothic 1, well, you'd like to play Gothic 2 anyways, but just in case, it's the same dynamic, reactive combat of the first game, where you can add combos, parry, and dodge. And your animations get better the more you level up in one-handed or two-handed, including bow and crossbow. There's magic in the game as well, of course, just like in the first Gothic game, but for me, and for those of you who've watched my uh, videos and maybe my Let's Plays and streams, you would know that I don't particularly play pure mage characters all the time. So any spells I cast, personally, was always done from spell scrolls. But for me, I've always played the Nameless as a melee guy who can also sneak around, pickpockets, and burglarize houses during the night, preferably in the upper quarter where the nobles live, because they got a lot of money. Bit of a pro tip, if you want the maximum experience possible from picking pockets, then wait until the last chapter before you reach the final area. The experience you get from picking pockets increases with each chapter. You can also pickpocket anyone in the game. By anyone, I mean literally anyone. Even your close friends, which is admittedly pretty hilarious. How it works is that once you're able to pickpocket, you just basically click on a dialogue option when you're talking to an NPC. And depending on your dexterity score, you'll either succeed or you'll fail. And if you fail, the NPC will attack you. So don't fail. Or just reload a save and come back later like I did.
All right, one more thing I want to talk about before I move on to the story segment, at least I hope this is the last thing I have to talk about, is the level up character progression and the accumulation of learning points in order to spend on your stats and skills. Just like in Gothic 1, you accumulate experience points by killing monsters, finishing quests, and picking pockets. Kind of duh, I know, but as you level up, you accumulate learning points to spend on various skills and stats, which you would then use on certain trainers you find throughout the game. So for example, the blacksmith in the harbor district can teach your strength score up to about 30, I believe. The thief will teach you how to be more dexterous, and one of the mercenaries can teach you how to use one-handed or two-handed weapons. Not for free, of course, and since this is an immersive game, these NPCs will not give you anything for free. So some of them require tasks to do, like for example the mercenary. You have to be a mercenary in order to learn how to fight. The militia sergeant will teach you for free because they want every citizen in fighting shape for the inevitable orc attack. But so long as you talk to everyone in the game, then trainers will be unlocked as you just naturally progress. With strength and dexterity, it only costs 1 or 5 points to increase it all the way to 100. With one-handed and two-handed though, and just like in the first game, if you want to be a master in two-handed, you have to also train one-handed at the same time. It's not like that in the Knight of the Raven add-on, but in the base game, if you raise two-handed up to, let's say, 30%, then it no longer requires 5 points to increase any further. It now requires 10 points, and when you spend those 10 points, it also raises your one-handed skill. It's the same thing for bows and crossbows too, so if you want to be a crossbowman, you also have to train your bow skill. And to add to the whole atmosphere of the game, I really like how NPCs actually teach you how to do the skill like a teacher would in real life. But anyways, as far as levels go, I did pretty much everything in the game that I could. I ended up at level 40 or 41, so naturally you'll reach either the high 30s, mid 30s, or the early 40s. And by everything, I mean everything, every quest, and pretty much almost every single creature that you can find in both maps of the game, including the ones that spawn in on every chapter. And now, finally, it's time to talk about the story of Gothic 2. It has been 13 days since the destruction of the barrier, and the opening cutscene reveals Zardas undergoing a ritual to bring back the nameless hero from the Sleeper's Temple. Unlike what the ending of Gothic 1 implies, the nameless hero did not succeed in escaping the Sleeper's Temple after all. I suppose the developers retconned this in order to explain why you start back at level 0 all over again. Which is completely fine with me, but regardless of that, there's actually not much story to Gothic 2 in regards to twists and turns. In fact, Zardas pretty much reveals everything about the game in the span of like 5 to 10 minutes. With his final furious scream, the Sleeper has set into movement the armies of darkness. It was an order to all evil creatures, a word of power that they were all bound to obey. His last order was, come, and they came, all of them, even the dragons. Dragons? They are creatures of an ancient power. I can sense their presence, even here. And they have gathered an entire army of lowly servant creatures around them. So the Nihilus Hero's task in this game is to find the Eye of Enos, and stop the dragons from conquering the country. You find out in the first 5-10 minutes that the nameless hero is destined to wear the Eye of Enos because he himself is a chosen of Enos. But first, Enos is the god of light, Adonos is the god of water neutrality, and Beliar is the god of darkness and is basically the indirect antagonist in the game. And the dragons are his, well, basically generals basically here in the game to enact his will. But with the Nameless Hero's task clear, he's free to go ahead and loot Zardas's tower and venture off into the wilderness to find the city of Carinus, the main city of the game. And it's a big city. But since the destruction of the barrier almost two weeks ago, the wilderness has been pretty much infested with monsters, orc scouts, and most notably convicts of the mining colony. So the city is sort of shut down and barred entry from anyone outside for anyone who is not a citizen. And this early on, and considering this is a game from 2003, you have many options to enter the city. You can work at the farm nearby and get yourself a decent set of clothes, and just tell the guards at the front gate that you're there to get some tools repaired at the blacksmith for the farm owner. You can steal the clothes, that'll make the farm owner angry if you encounter them later on, or you can accept a city pass from a shady merchant sitting outside the farm in exchange for a favor, or you can swim there. 
or you can be like me and just do all of those things to get the most experience possible, but either way, you have options here. Backing up a bit, Zardas tells you that in order to find the Eye of Enos, you have to go talk to the leader of the Paladins in the city of Carinus. The problem with that is that the leader of the Paladins is in the upper quarter, and the upper quarter is blocked to anyone who is not a citizen. And since the nameless hero is a convict of the mining colony and has never been to Carinus, that makes him a non-citizen. The city pass just gets you in the city. It doesn't make you a citizen of Carinus. In order to become a citizen, you have to learn a trade with one of the masters. And there are three. Well, four, but you can only join three. And that's the hunter, the blacksmith, and the alchemist. The fourth one is the carpenter, and he doesn't accept apprentices, because he can't afford one. But it's not as simple as going up to a master and saying, hey, I want to be your apprentice. You have to get the approval of all the other masters first in order to sign on with either the hunter, blacksmith, or alchemist. Depending on which faction you join, I believe you can skip all this and just go straight to the upper quarter. Which brings me to one of the best things about the Gothic games, the factions, and there are three. You can choose to become a mercenary, just like in the first game, and later become a dragon hunter. Or you can join the militia and then become a paladin. Or you can become a novice of the Magicians of Fire and then later become a Magician of Fire at the monastery. In order to become a mercenary, you have to get voted in by the others, as well as doing a task to show that you're capable, as well as win duels and basically stand up for yourself because mercenaries are cold-hearted scoundrels. Methinks I'm gonna punch you in the face. What? That's exactly what you need right now. I've been too nice to you so far, haven't I? Finish him! Not bad. In order to join the militia, you basically just have to become a citizen of Carinus and go talk to the commander at the barracks. They need bodies and they're desperate for members, so they're pretty easy to join. If for some reason you don't want to become a citizen of Carinus, then the commander of the barracks gives you a task to find the Thieves Guild and basically kill all the members. I've never joined the monastery in Gothic 2 because I'm not much of a mage guy, but they require 1000 gold and a sheep from the landowner's farm. Out of all of these though, I always choose the mercenaries for almost every single subsequent playthrough. The simple reason for that is, is that a lot of the Nameless's friends and companions are mercenaries. And on a thematic standpoint, on top of his independent personality, I think the mercenaries is much, much more fitting for him than being a paladin or a magician of fire. But regardless of that, you are completely free to choose whatever faction you want. Back when I first played this, I played as a mercenary first, and I immediately wanted to play it again, so I played it as a Militia and then a Paladin. The Paladin is a very, very interesting class in this game. Unlike Mercenaries basically being melee brutes, Paladins are much the same, but they can also cast Holy Spells through the use of Paladin runes. Namely a Light Spell, Smiting Evil Spells, and Healing Spells. Maybe not very, very interesting, but very, very thematic. The Paladin class is a fun class to play, so play whatever class you want. If I ever play this game again in the future, it's going to be with a paladin. Whatever requirements you finish in order to get to the upper quarter, Lord Hagen, the leader of the paladins, does not give you the Eye of Enos. Go figure, that would be too easy. In fact, him and the other paladins in the city are completely skeptical of your call about the dragons evading the country. So, he tasks you, the nameless hero, into going to the Valley of Mines to find proof of the dragons and make contact with the paladins there at the old castle where the old camp was. So unlike one big map to explore in Gothic 1, you have two. Not only Carinus, you get to explore the Valley of Mines all over again. And for those of you who played Gothic 1 before 2, back when they came out, I can imagine the feeling of excitement being told you have to visit the very same place that you were thrown in in the first game. For me, I played Gothic 2 first in like 2005 or 6 or something like that, and then I went back to play Gothic 1 after. But anyways, instead of being a prisoner of the colony all over again, the Nihilus hero is willingly going back to the Valley of Mines to find evidence of dragons. And if you can believe it, the Valley of Mines is much, much more dangerous than the first game. After the destruction of the barrier, the Valley of Mines was flooded with monsters and most notably orcs. And they got the entire castle, Gomez's old castle of the old camp, completely surrounded with the paladins trapped inside with nowhere to go. The Nihilus hero basically has to sneak his way through the orcish besieging lines and make it into the old castle to make contact with the leader of the paladins there. He, unfortunately, won't send you back to Lord Hagen with proof unless you do a task for him. And he wants you to go visit the three mining sites 
and report back with how much magical ore the diggers there have dug up. Then he'll send you back to Lord Hagen with a request for reinforcements. So re-exploring the Valley of Mines after playing Gothic 1 back in the day was much, much more meaningful for me. I'm a little disappointed now that you can't really explore the swamp camp anymore because a portion of the map is blocked off by an orcish wall. You can't fight them yet, but there are four dragons in the Valley of Mines, and one of them is a swamp dragon. And you'd think the swamp dragon would be, well, in the swamp camp. But instead they put him in a new swamp area just a bit south of the new camp. You can visit the new camp, but it's basically destroyed and being used by the ice dragon. So you can't visit any of the stone houses in that cave in the previous game. And you can't visit the free mines either because the path there has been destroyed. Quite a few areas that you were able to visit in the first game is basically unavailable to you in this game. But the overall atmosphere in the Valley of Mines, it's much more oppressive than the first game, if you can believe that. The prisoners really had a good system in the first game and actually kept it pretty safe if you think about it. Here it's basically the Wild West, where only the strong can survive. If you're like me though, I pretty much eliminated almost every single enemy before having to go back to Lord Hagen. Killing all the orcs besieging the castle creates this amusing situation where the paladins can pretty much just up and leave if they want to since the path is clear to them, but story-wise they're supposed to stay there otherwise you won't be able to finish the game. But either way, once you finish up in the Valley of Mines, you have to go back to Carinus and now you're being attacked by these strange magicians in black robes, Agents of Beliar. Master wants your head. No one can save you now. That's like the only twist in this game that they throw at you. They're a little annoying because when you come into contact with them, their gaze basically prevents the character from regaining his health when he goes to sleep. The only way to fix this is by going to the monastery and buying some potions that will cure it. But once you go back to Lord Hagen, he believes you about the dragons and then now you're allowed to go get the Eye of Enos. The problem is that once you find it, it's broken and you gotta fix it. In order to fix it, you have to get the jewelry fixed by the mercenary's blacksmith and find one agent for each god to perform a reverse ritual and restore its power. The latter is thematically slightly difficult because one of those agents is Zardas himself and the other is the head magician of fire at the monastery and they don't like each other. Vatras wants Zardas and you to help him with that. What? Zardas will be there too? You cannot be serious. Once they get over their differences though, the Eye of Enos is finally fixed, and that's a good thing too because the Eye of Enos is required to defeat each dragon in the Valley of Mines, as well as the final boss of the game. With the next task of the Nameless clear, he has to go back to the Valley of Mines, and at this point you become either a dragon hunter, a paladin, or a magician of fire. One of the other benefits to the Eye of Enos, other than killing them, is that they're forced to tell the truth to the main character. And also, at least in the base game, it's recommended to learn how to take dragon scales from one of the dragon hunters in the Valley of Mines. Doing so will basically get you the best armor for dragon hunters. The dragon blood will get you the best weapon. Once you've gotten those requirements though, you're not the only one trying to hunt dragons here in the colony. And, funnily enough, these Dragon Hunters are not going to get very far without the Eye of Enos, so their plan was doomed before it even started. The only one who came close to succeeding is honestly Silvio and Bulko, the former mercenaries back at the landowner's farm. They basically get the main character to kill the Ice Dragon, and then they try to kill him and take all his treasure. But with the Ice Dragon being in the new camp in the northwest section, there's three more. The Swamp Dragon is a bit to the south in that makeshift swamp area. The Stone Dragon is at the castle, not the old castle the old, old castle in the far south eastish corner. And the last dragon, the fire dragon, is at the highest peak of the Valley of Mines, near where you met Urshak in the first game. Once the Nameless Hero has slain all the dragons though, his task is not done. He has to go back to Carinus, obtain a boat, and recruit sailors for the journey to the final area, the Halls of Irdarath. So unlike games where you just basically enter a boat and just start riding everywhere, well, you can't do that in Gothic 2. First, you need to hire a captain who has experience steering ships. But other than the captain, you have to recruit trusted companions to join you on your journey. And a lot of returning companions from Gothic 1 make it into Gothic 2, even the minor ones. You got Diego, Lee, Gorn, Milton, and who could forget Lester, the laziest companion in the entire Gothic series. Hmm. 
Damn it. What's up? As well as some minor ones like Wolf, who, and I have to mention this, I was gonna dump Wolf in favor of Diego because I didn't know there was a limit to how many companions you can bring onto your ship. But when I try to let him go, he tries to kill you for letting his hopes up. I can't use you after all. First you give me hope and then a rejection like that. You bastard, I'll pay you back for that. Oh now. Wolf is a former convict of the mining colony and he was a mercenary in the new camp. There's a quest involved where he makes minecrawler plates for you towards the end of the game. And he was pretty desperate to get the heck off the mainland. And to get his hopes up like that, well, it makes sense for him to attack you. I'm also not complaining in any way because I love it when characters have personalities like this in video games. That's what I get for just treating him like an NPC, right? Once you've gotten your crew, it's time to sail off to the Halls of Irdarath, the final area of the game, and a pretty neat area, I think. Lots of orcs, a cave troll, undead orcs, and black magicians to slay. As well as some skeletons and these cool looking shadow knights. There's not much to say here other than fighting your way through, taking out another dragon, and facing off against the final boss of the game, an undead looking dragon. Not looking, he is an undead dragon, excuse me. I hope you still have your Eye of Enos because I forgot to mention it has to get recharged every time you kill a dragon. So if you haven't recharged it, well you should probably do that before facing off against him. In order to recharge it, it requires a dragon heart. I also forgot to mention that the Eye of Enos actually gives you some pretty good defensive buffs to your main character. You should pretty much always wear it whenever you can. After some evil exposition where the dragon basically reveals that him and the main character are much the same way in the fact that they're basically agents to their specific god, you kill it, Zardas teleports in, and steals its power. Going back to the ship, and before setting off into the sunset, Zardas is in the Nameless Hero's cabin, and basically fills him in on, well, I'll just play the cutscene. And the human slew the beast, and it entered into Belyar's realm. Zardas! What exactly happened in the Temple of Irdarath? With the help of Inos, you have defeated the Avatar of Evil. And I have taken its power unto myself. Since I left the Circle of Fire, this alone has been my goal. What was denied to me in the Temple of the Sleeper has now finally come to pass. Belyar has chosen me. So, you obey the God of Darkness now? No, I do not obey Belior any more than you obey Enos. Not even the gods know what fate has in store for us. And I am only just beginning to grasp what options are open to me. But one thing is certain, we shall meet again. And then the game ends at a bit of a cliffhanger. A way to get us excited for the inevitable Gothic 3, which was a pretty disappointing game for some fans, and maybe I'll talk about it one day, but other than that, I really didn't want this game to end. So back in the day, when I played this for the very first time, I immediately started up another playthrough and played as a Militia Paladin. And that's how you know you're playing a good game. With Pranobites potentially not being around anymore, I would not even mind a clone of Gothic 1 and 2. There's the remake of Gothic 1 that's currently being made right now, but I'm not quite too interested in that. But either way, there's always the Chronicles of Mertana, Arkelos. And for those of you who don't know who happen to be Gothic fans, Arkelos is a mod for Gothic 2. And apparently it's very, very, very good. On the Steam page right now, it says overwhelmingly positive, released in 2021, and that is something. I'm definitely going to play it one day. But as far as Gothic 2 goes, I think that's kind of all I have to say about it. So thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again either here or on the other channel.